So in preparation for this deep sky video, I essentially threw a virtual dart at the list of objects that hadn't been done that were on the website, and it landed on M50. I just closed my eyes and pointed. Of course, I went to Wikipedia to look it up, and there were two lines on Wikipedia about M50. And the most interesting thing about it seemed to be that it was heart-shaped. So I figured this was going to be a tough one. So it happens to be an open cluster, which is probably one of the less spectacular kinds of objects in the Messier catalogue. It's young, about 130 million years old, and it's just a collection of stars that would have formed out of the same molecular cloud in the same location in space and are pretty much the same age as well. Okay, so I need to find something interesting to say about this open cluster. So what I found was a paper which was part of a monitoring program which looks at the variability of stars in clusters like this. Now stars can vary for a number of reasons. They can vary for intrinsic reasons because they're big pulsating stars that vary on a regular basis or they're cataclysmic variables that throw off material occasionally. Um, or they can vary through extrinsic reasons, for external reasons, either because something is passing in front of it and causing it to dim, and that's a really exciting way in which we're uncovering lots of extrasolar planets at the moment, or simply because they're rotating and they have some sort of rotational variability because of, well, not sunspots, but of star spots, variations on the surface that will appear and reappear and cause little 1% dips. This paper was monitoring it for th those, those last two reasons. But to do this, of course, you have to take lots of images over a very long period of time. For the observing run in question, you know, three, four, six nights, and then separated by a gap of another of 10 months where they went back to the telescope. And for each one of these nights where they were sitting at the telescope, they were basically taking a 75 second exposure of this object, reading it out, taking another one, looking at moving to another object, doing the same thing, moving back, moving back, and doing it over and over again. So you can imagine how tedious this observing run must have been. But in the end, they had a really good catalog of data for M50, and they were able to determine the rotation periods for a lot of the members, hundreds of the members of, of stars in this cluster. So it was like they were doing a big census of this cluster and really getting to know the stars in there a bit better. It's, yeah, absolutely. Because there are a few fundamental properties that you want to measure about stars. You want to measure their brightness, um, their color, their mass and, and their rotational period. And so for an open cluster like this, it's interesting because you know the distance to it, so you know all the stars are roughly the same distance away from you, and you also know that because they formed at the same time, they're all roughly the same age. So then you can start to look at variations of the rotation properties uh, with some of the other properties of the stars, like their mass, like their metallicity. So this is not the actual paper in question, but it uses the data from it. So what we're looking at here is a compilation of very similar studies. And so M50 is this panel here. So that's our object right here. But what we're looking at is a series of other clusters for which these observations have been made, and they're arranged in increasing age. So you can see up here, we've got one to three million years. These are, these are stars that are just barely being formed. And then they increase in age, we get up to M50 at 130 million years, still a young cluster. And then we go down to uh, something like the Hyades open cluster, which is quite old, you know, 600 million years. So the plot that we're looking at in each one of these panels, so each one of these dots is a star in that cluster, and the mass of the, the star is increasing this way. And so you're getting up to no one here, which is the mass of our sun. And then on the y-axis here, you've got the period. So how long it takes to rotate about its own axis. And so for our sun, that is about 24 days. Um, the, the exact number is, is a little complicated, but it's about 24 days. The, the more to the right the star is, the more massive it is, and the higher it is on this plot, the more slowly it's spinning the longer its period. So M50 here is one piece of this jigsaw puzzle that's evolving in time. And you can see how things are changing here. So first of all, when, with a cluster like this, which is really young, you've got your stars forming, but they've got a real scatter. They've got a real range of periods, about two orders of magnitudes, or about 100 times. And so as you move up here, you see an interesting pattern form. And it really sort of comes into its own at about this age with M M50 which is as you go up in mass, you see a sort of a tight sequence form here. And that means the lower mass stars are rotating faster, 
but the higher mass ones are rotating more slowly. And there's a lot of physics behind this, which is not entirely understood, which is why the data from M50 is one important part of this, this puzzle to, to try to understand the physics of what's going on here. But essentially it all comes down to angular momentum because a few things can happen. As the star is forming, it's contracting, and so it's actually spinning up. So just as a figure skater, as they pull their arms in, as they, they bring their mass closer to the center, they will spin faster. So a collapsing star will spin up as it gravitationally collapses. This is complicated because it's usually surrounded by a disk of material that's, that's helping it form. And so there's coupling between the star and the disk, which is, gets a bit complicated. But then once it's sitting on its own, these stars are just just normal low mass stars sort of living the main part of their life. They're on what we call the main sequence. And so they're sitting there, they're rotating, but as they rotate, they're throwing off material through their stellar wind. So this is a coupling of the magnetic field with the plasma in the star, um, and, and the material is re released off and blown out. And we see this from our own sun, and you know, solar storms will send charged material our, our way that will impact on you know, our television reception or whatever. The result of this, in terms of the rotation period of the star, is the opposite of the gravitational contraction. As the material gets thrown off, the angular momentum is conserved, and the star um, starts to spin down. Its period gets longer, and it rises up on this curve. Okay? And for complicated reasons of physics, we think that, that this then converges. As the stars get older, as we see in these increasingly older snapshots of clusters, uh, we don't have the fast rotators anymore, and we have a really tight sequence relating the mass to the rotational period, and all those stars have been, have been spun, spun down, and they're all rotating at a, a, a longer period. I can't provide you with any answers here. M50 in this case is essentially a snapshot of a cluster marking one age sequence in, in this um, stellar evolution. Um, so we can't sit and watch the stars evolve over hundreds of millions of years. All we can do is find different clusters that are of different ages and see how things change with age. This is really opening up a fairly new field called gyrochronicity, which is essentially using the rotation period of a star to estimate its age. And not just from a cluster where you essentially know that they're all the same age and you can figure out what that age is, but any old random star. Um, and so that's quite a, quite a new field. Um, but, but this is all sort of material that's feeding into our understanding of how stars evolve. Are astronomers not already good enough at getting the age of stars without having to use this extra elaborate feature of them to guess the age? No, stars are, stars are pretty complicated. Um, and there's a lot of, of subtleties and, and, as I said, very interesting physics that goes on. That means, you know, remember, there's only so many measurements that we're able to make of a star as we sit here on Earth. So, yeah, there's still lots for us to figure out. So this is what I wanted to show you. It's the grave of Charles Messier, his final resting place. There's actually surprisingly few markings on the grave. Now when we first came in, there was a list of all the famous people buried in this cemetery. It's one of the most famous cemeteries in the world, and Messier wasn't actually on there. I think this would have been very difficult to find if it wasn't for some helpful information on the internet.